you. Um, right. I can't see it coming up where it norm. Oh no, here we go, share that. Sorry, bear with me. Okay. Um, can you see that? What we can. Um, okay. And what we tend to do is people tend to message because we used to find that people would would put their um, voice on. Voice on, I can't get the words out today. <laughs> um, but then there was a lot of background noise, so nice. um, we tend to use the chat box for okay. um, questions and things. So if you need me or Craig to sort of, if there's a lot piling up and you want to stop and, and read through them, then we can do that. Brilliant. Yeah, there's a couple of points for sort of uh, interactive discussion as okay. well, if there is anything, so uh, we can prompt. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, Brilliant. If, okay. if, if necessary, it's very easy for me just to open it up so that everybody can turn their mics on. Oh, well okay. done. OK, thanks, Craig. Great, thank you. Um, OK, Sophie, you in. Oh, yeah, Sophie's in. OK, so um, if I make a start. Um, here we go, let's see if I can just. OK, is that coming through OK? Perfect. Brilliant, thank you. So thank you for having us to speak to you today. Um, I'm Anna McKendry and my colleague Sophie Herbert. Um, we're going to be talking to you today and giving a bit of a sexual health update. Um, I have to go at half past one, so Sophie's here for the full session. So um, apologies for that. Um, so just a bit about what we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to talk a bit about our service, um, who we are, what we do, what we can provide, um, how you can get in contact with us, um, a bit about training, training needs um, and a chance for feedback as well. And we'd be grateful to hear your thoughts as well on the service and, and your needs um, and then a bit of time for discussion as well. So, um, so our service, so we're a county wide service. Um, there are the two, uh, the North and the West Unitary Authorities, but we are commissioned jointly and, and provide county wide service. Um, we have two hubs, so uh, we have Area R at um, NGH um, and then Ashwood Centre at St Mary's Hospital in Kettering. And then we have our outreach service who work across the county um, and we also do other clinics such as Icebrook at uh, Icebrook Hospital in Wellingborough. Um, and there are two consultants, three consultants, Sophie, myself, and then we work with Lynn Riddell as well. Um, so uh, in terms of what do we do? So we generally work across the three sections of sexual health, contraception and HIV. Um, and we'll talk a bit about each um, division separately, but um, as an overview with sexual health, we provide screening um, and testing for sexually transmitted infections and treatment accordingly. Um, we give PEP, the post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV um, and PrEP, so pre-exposure prophylaxis, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, vaccinations, we also provide onward uh, management for sexual assault. Um, so we accept referrals from Serenity, the Sexual Assault Referral Centre, um, and we also run a young person service as well. In terms of contraception, um, we provide emergency um, contraception, um, LARC methods, um, uh, with, uh, and for under 19s, we provide um, any contraception, so basic contraception as well as LARC methods. For 19 and over, um, we're only commissioned to provide um, LARC methods. Um, and then we also run a deep implant service. Um, and then in the HIV um, units, we manage uh, new HIV diagnoses, um, those who are pregnant, um, and we work closely with um, the antenatal service. Uh, also, uh, we have patients who are co-infected with hepatitis. Um, we provide a liaison service and advice to inpatients at, uh, within the acute hospitals. Um, and, and we're also involved in HIV screening within the acute hospitals as well. And again, a bit more about that later. So if I just start a bit about contraception then um, and what, what do we provide? So as I mentioned, our contract really is um, uh, just for 
uh, LARC methods and basic contraception for those that are under 19, LARC methods for 19 and over, um, so the depots, implants and, and um, uh, coils. Um, in terms of coils, um, we can only um, provide we can only provide contraceptive methods for contraception purposes. So, if people need um, hormonal methods for non-contraceptive purposes, um, we can't actually do that, um, and that would need to be done within primary care or gynae for referral. Um, but if they need that as well as contraception, then then we can do that. Um, in terms of LARC provision, um, we, I mean, I think as everybody has found, there's been increased demand and waiting lists um, since the pandemic, and we're sort of working our way through that. Um, and I think currently, um, implants you can get a little bit quicker within a few weeks, um, but coils a little bit longer, probably, and it's a bit longer in the, the north of the county. Um, but I wonder, it might be useful just to get some feedback from anybody else about how things are in primary care with um, waiting lists and provision of LARC. How is everybody finding that? I can't see the chat actually, so I don't know. I can see it. I can see it too, Anna. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Anything coming through or not? No, not yet. No. OK, that's fine. We'll move on a bit, someone, maybe. Oh. Anna, someone's just said that they've had a long list, but they're getting on top of it recently. Brilliant. Yeah, I think that seems to be the general picture. Um, OK. Um, and then um, I thought we just mentioned about um, emergency hormonal contraception. So we contract um, community pharmacies to provide um, this. Uh, and so I'll just move on to the next slide. So this is just a map which shows which pharmacies um, can provide free EHC um, for, for women that require. So we have, I think, 13 pharmacies signed up across the county at the moment um, and we're working on recruiting some more. There is a little bit of a gap towards the south of the county, but the, um, we keep all the details up to date. So it's just somewhere else to signpost people to if they need. Um, the map and the list of all the pharmacies with their contact details are all on our website. So and that's updated regularly as, as new pharmacies are, are added. Um, OK, and then I thought I'd just mention about deep um, implant uh, removals as well. So for the contraceptive implants that can't be removed, um, historically, I think we've had referrals come to us and then also NGH and KGH. Um, but more recently, um, we've been working with the acute hospital, with, well, with NGH particularly and commissioners to try and have a, 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 a more uniform um, referral pathway. So um, this has all just been finalised in the last couple of weeks. So I thought I'd just show you the, the slides, which will also be disseminated through other channels. But essentially any um, uh, implant that's, uh, that is deep and or impal impalpable should be referred um, directly to NISH. Um, and the email address there is ashwood.centre at nhs.net. Um, so you can send referrals there and then we'll get in contact directly with the patient and book them into to the clinic. Um, our colleague, Dr. Ros Phillips, who's also the faculty trainer within the service. Um, so she runs a regular deep implant uh, clinic. Um, so they roughly every couple of months or so. Um, but we usually try and batch people up so we've got a, a full clinic to do. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so if everyone can be referred to us in the first instance, um, so any any implants that are impalpable or they're partially palpable and difficult to remove, any failed removals, um, the ones that what go straight to uh, Northampton to NGH um, would be if um, specialist skills are needed. So if the implants are sighted close to a large vessel, for instance, and that's already known prior to the referral, or if the patient needs a general anaesthetic or increased monitoring for any reason, um, then they then, then NISH wouldn't be the right setting. They'd need to go to to NGH. Um, and if we've already obviously tried to remove the implants, then then they would they need to go to NGH. But normally we would have already referred onwards, and there should be a plan in place. So we would see them um, and if 
for any reason we can't remove the implant, um, then we would refer onwards to NGH um, to Mr Kerr and Ebru Freed and um, that referral email address is there as well. I don't think, I did have the um, Ashwood phone number up here but it hasn't come out I don't think, but it, we've got it on one of the later slides. But if there are any queries about this you can just get directly in contact with Ashwood Centre um, and we will, um, uh, we can sort that out. Okay. Right, yeah. sexual health. Right, I'm going to do a switch around with Sophie. <laughs> Hello. Right, I hope you can all see me. So, um, I'm Sophie Herbert. I'm one of the other consultants. Um, we're doing a bit of a jiggle because we because Anna has to go to a different meeting in another room on a different computer. So, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about the sexual health side. So, um, we uh, we were commissioned um, about. Well, probably about four years ago we went out to tender and so our current contract allows us to do testing and diagnosis of asymptomatic and symptomatic patients. Um, we're also commissioned to provide um, service for complex recurrent symptoms so people with recurrent thrush or BV, um, difficult to treat, trichomonas um, and anything that is tricky to manage um, we'd be happy to see. And then I'll talk a little bit about PrEP. So um, many of you may be aware of uh, PrEP. PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. Um, it's a medicine that you take either on a daily basis or what we call event based, which is before and after sex. And at the moment, we've got over 400 patients um, currently receiving PrEP here, the majority of whom are men who have sex with other men. But um, PrEP isn't just for gay men. Um, it, it is available for anyone who is potentially at risk. So this is a bit of a plea really for um, you in general practice that if you think somebody might be eligible for PrEP, then please tell them to get in touch with us. Um, we've really struggled to get any um, heterosexual men or um, heterosexual women to go on to PrEP, even though some of them are quite high risk. So if you think that they might be eligible, then um, get them to have a chat to us. And the other thing is that Terence Higgins Trust have a, um, a website and you can go on there and have a look and see whether you think you might be um, eligible for PrEP. So we sometimes direct patients to that so they can assess their own risk and see whether it might be for them. So with PrEP, we do follow up for them um, every three to six months. We've just moved to six monthly, so people are getting six months of medication now at a time, um, but we're still testing people remotely at three months. Um, through postal kit testing or they can elect to come in. Um, but that's been a significant increase in our workload. Um, we also offer vaccination, so I've just put the main four there. Um, we do hepatitis A um, and B vaccinations for certain populations. Um, we also offer the HPV vaccine for um, men who have sex with men up to the age of 45. Um, and we are currently offering monkeypox vaccine, which is in the wake of the monkeypox outbreak. Um, you may hear from patients that they haven't been able to get a monkeypox vaccine. Uh, it's been quite difficult in the local area to secure vaccine supplies. Um, so compared to the bigger clinics in London and uh, Manchester and Birmingham, we've been really struggling to physically get hold of any vaccine. So we do have it now and we do run clinics. Um, we've been doing them at weekends. Um, but if you've got patients who are interested in the vaccine, then just tell them to get in touch with us. Um, also, what we do is partner notification. So um, you might diagnose somebody with chlamydia within your service and um, those partners will need to be contacted. And that's an extra piece of work that we appreciate you wouldn't have time for. And we're happy to take that on for you. Um, and also, as Anna mentioned before, we have our young people service. So anybody under the age of 19 can walk into our clinics. We have a clinic on a Wednesday afternoon at Northampton General in our clinic there. And then on Thursday, um, we have one at Ashwood. This is quite well used more on the Ashwood site, actually, but we, we can see sometimes up to 20 young people. And in that session, um, you don't need to book an appointment. Um, you can just walk in. Um, we do contraception. Um, testing and um, complicated GU depending on whatever the young person needs um, and we also have a health advisor who's working with us who will um, cover any safeguarding issues or any concerns. 
OK, and then we've got our chat health. So um, you may be familiar with this through the 0 to 19 service. So chat health is um, an umbrella organisation that provide um, text contact for for anybody, really, depending on what the chat health is used for. But we have chat health for our um, under 24 year olds um, so they can just text the number with a query or um, often people might want to get in touch with us to book an appointment or ask advice um, and that will come through to us through a special system on the computer and we allocate a member of staff to check those texts um, in on a daily basis. So it's manned between our office hours, so usually nine till seven Monday to Thursday and nine till I think three or four on Friday and we're not here at the weekend and there's a bounce back message um, if anybody needs urgent care. And then the last thing just to mention is about C-Card. So um, C-Card is a service where we get um, often third sector providers to sign up to being able to give C-Card and then they are able to give condoms um, in certain numbers to those people who are already registered with us. And you can also direct people to get condoms through our website and through our outreach team. OK. So I just thought it might be worth highlighting what we're not commissioned to do. And this is not to be negative. It's more just to explain why sometimes things that are referred to us aren't seen by us. Um, and over the last few years, this has been a national thing. So it's not just in Northamptonshire, but the commissioning arrangements changed several years ago now. And nearly all of our colleagues in sexual health across the country are struggling with these particular things. So the first thing is genital dermatology. Um, obviously, we know that in general practice, you're really good at dermatology, um, but there are some aspects of genital dermatology which um, either patients don't want to go to their local GP about and present to us or um, some of our colleagues don't don't necessarily know the best way to manage that and that's totally fine. Um, we used to be able to do this and there's actually a special interest group of, of our sexual health kind of um, organisation um, but in Northamptonshire we're currently not commissioned to provide this service so the way we've got around that is that we're more than happy to see people, particularly if they present um, and we might make a diagnosis and then we might start the treatment, for example, for lichen sclerosis. And then we might um, refer back to you in general practice to do the follow up for that, if that's OK with you and you're happy. Um, in terms of psychosexual medicine, um, similarly to genital dermatology, there's quite a big gap for this. Um, we're not commissioned to provide it, but we do have um, a psychologist who works within our service. And usually if someone presents to us, we will signpost to her and then she will signpost them on to the next um, appropriate service. There isn't very much in the county for psychosexual medicine currently. Um, and obviously in terms of things like erectile dysfunction, we would refer back to yourselves first because of needing to exclude all the um, organic causes. But um, just to make a highlight that that's not something that we're currently able to provide. Um, basic contraception for over 19. So we used to provide this, but in the last tender, um, we we are no longer able to do that. So. In a similar way to genital dermatology, um, I would say a woman in her mid 20s might come to us for contraception. If she want, chooses to have a combined method, we would start her on that for three months because we don't want to leave somebody without any cover. And then we would refer them back to yourselves to continue to get their um, care there. Smears. Um, so <laughs> you may be aware of this, but many years ago we used to do smear testing in clinic and then we were told we were not allowed to do it anymore um so all of us didn't complete the training because there wasn't any need um and now it looks as if we may well be delivering smears again so at the moment we've been asked to provide smear testing for specific high risk groups that can't seem to access smears in general practice for whatever reason i don't think anyone's entirely sure why they're not accessing them um, but to be honest, our uptake has been very, very low. Um, and so so we do offer these on an ad hoc basis. So if you have someone who struggles to get their smear that you think might come to a Saturday clinic with us, um, then you can direct them to us. But um, we're really only offering them for um, hard to reach groups at the moment.
And the last thing just to say, we do, as I mentioned before, do vaccines, but we don't vaccinate everybody. So um, each vaccine has a very specific criteria that we can offer it in sexual health. Um, so, for example, we wouldn't vaccinate healthcare workers for Hep B, but we can offer it for those who are at risk sexually. Um, and the same with monkeypox at the moment, it's only available for um, gay men. Um, but it may be that if monkeypox became more widespread, that we might be able to offer it for other people. But at the moment, it's just restricted. OK, so just wanted to highlight a little bit about our outreach team. So we do contraception, um, sexual health and HIV as our main three, but we also have an outreach branch and they do all sorts of work. You can't really see this very clearly, but it was just to remind me really <laughs> that um, they do a lot of education in schools, mainly doing um, sex education for the 16 to 19 group um, in colleges and in um, not in education and training kind of provision settings. Um, they do a lot in HIV testing week and recently they've been involved in more testing for hepatitis C with the Hep C Trust. Um, they do a lot of um, LGBTQ plus sort of outreach, um, often with our local partners um, across the county. Um, they also get involved with certain events to sort of promote health. So um, there was an alcohol awareness event. Um, they go to St Andrews and do things. And they've also been involved in um, testing for sexual health um, infections in one of the asylum hotels locally. So they do a really broad range of things um, that I thought we might just highlight. And also chat health, this is the number. So I don't know if you want to take this down. Um, the, if you want to give this to your young people um, in your service, you're more than welcome to. So they can just text that and it's um, it's anonymous to a point. Obviously, they've got the telephone number. Um, and if they wanted to get into touch with the clinic, we would take more further details from them. And maybe if you've got any questions at the end, I'll um, I'll be able to fill you in on that. OK, sorry, it's, it's a lot of me talking and not so much of Anna. Um, <laughs> so um, she's still here, though. Um, so for HIV care, um, we have the Summers Unit, which is based in Northampton and the Ashwood Centre, which is in Kettering. And then I do a clinic every other week in Corby at Stewart Road. Um, and we do sometimes see patients in our clinic on a Friday morning at Wellingborough if they are unable to travel. And then more recently, as our population has aged, we've um, started doing some visits, home visits in the community for our um, kind of complex and frail elderly patients. So we have a really large cohort in Northamptonshire, um, much larger, I think, than people expect. Um, and also we are only three consultants, which is um, quite unusual for the size of this cohort. Um, so we are our busy service and our specialist nurses do a really good job of um, ticking people over. And we've only really been able to manage to do that because a lot of our patients now are extremely stable. So um, most of our patients are seeing us six monthly, but we realised through COVID that probably they didn't need to be seen every six months and that we might be able to see them annually. So you may start to see letters coming from us saying that this person's very stable and that we will see them on an annual basis with a telephone review at six months. So we're calling those people cohort A, but um, that's just for us. Um, from your point of view, we are confident that that's completely safe um, and the patients seem to love it because they don't have to come to see us as much as, as they did before. Having said that, the door is still open for them. So when we talk to them about going on to this sort of stable annual review, um, we do still let them know that if there's a problem or they're concerned that they should contact us. Um, just to point out as well, a bit like the GU side, we are commissioned to provide HIV care locally, um, and that includes providing the antiretroviral drugs. But unfortunately, we are not able to prescribe for other associated things. And you can argue that that's actually probably a good thing. Um, we, we know that you guys are much better at managing hypertension and high cholesterol and bone related um, complications. Um, so we we might, for example, note that a blood pressure was high in our clinic and then we would refer back to yourself for management of that. And that's partly because over the years we've lost that expertise, but also because um, we would not get reimbursed for any non HIV related medications that we prescribe. 
Um, and I think that's similar to lots of other specialties in the main hospital. So um, also just wanted to highlight about drug interactions. I think depending on which um, primary care system you use, having spoken to GP colleagues that, you know, or flash up when there's an interaction when you're trying to prescribe something. Um, but if you're stuck and you're not aware, there is a special website from Liverpool University where they have, I probably should have put it in actually, but they basically, you can put in the drugs that the patient's taking, you put in the ones that you want to prescribe and it will give you a red, amber, green rating as to how safe it is. Obviously, red is don't prescribe, um, amber is usually one or two of the drug levels will go up or down and then green is it's absolutely fine. What we do tend to say to patients is that if um, if they don't want to tell their GP that they do have HIV, then the onus is on them to let us know if any new drugs have been prescribed. Um, but we do strongly encourage all of our patients to let you know about their status so that you are aware of it when you're prescribing. Um, we also have a specialist pharmacist, VJ, who's more than happy to answer questions um, and talk about um, interactions if that's an issue for you. Um, I'm conscious Anna's going to go in a minute. So if there's any, I can't also see the chat. If there's any quick questions on contraception, you might want to shout now. Otherwise, I'll plod on and collect them. <laughs> I'm hoping that Craig might let me know. Right, I'm going to assume there aren't any and then we'll deal with them at the end. And then Anna and I can get back to you if there's something I can't answer. Is that right? Thank you. Anna. Um, just. Yeah. Just checking through and, and no, there haven't been, apart from some nice compliments. Oh. One, one there from, from, from Darren at Burton Latimer, your outreach team has been brilliant in its support to our hard to reach homeless people in Corby and Kettering. Hey. There we go. <laughs> I like that. Great. Yeah, Great. I, think, I think there was two questions, but I don't, I think they may have already been answered actually. Oh, okay. Um, what makes someone eligible for the pre-exposure prophylaxis? Um, yes. And can, the, yeah. is the EC free at the pharmacy for all ages? That's the two that I picked up anyway. Yeah, so the EHC is free un, under 25. Up, up to 55. Oh, up to yeah, 55. Yeah. Sorry, Anna's, Anna's speaking to me. Yeah, up to 55. We just, we negotiated that actually in the last couple of years. So it used to be under 25, now it's up to 55. So that's free um, at the pharmacies. And in terms of PrEP, yeah, so um, I could have done a whole talk on PrEP. Um, I'll just touch on it now because um, PrEP is relatively new and I think that the information about it is trickling out into general practice, but quite slowly. So essentially, if you, um, to be eligible for PrEP, it's quite woolly. <laughs> you have to either be a person who, ha who is a um, man having sex with another man or a trans woman um, who's had unprotected set anal sex in the last six months. Um, or you have to be having other risks. So what those risks would be are having sex with partners from a high risk country. So the obvious candidates, so sub-Saharan Africa, um, Southeast Asia, some countries in South America. Um, if you are an injecting drug user, if you're a sex worker, if you um, are in a relationship with somebody who has HIV, which is not controlled on treatment, we would offer PrEP to the, the negative partner. Um, and I'm just thinking, is that everyone? Yes. Oh, and if you have recurrent bacterial infections. So if you'd had, you know, three episodes of gonorrhea and two episodes of chlamydia in the last year, we would hazard a guess you might be high risk and therefore might benefit from PrEP. So. PrEP doesn't protect against anything other than HIV, um, but it has been highly effective at reducing HIV transmission. And the, the main data from the London clinics, um, where they have thousands and thousands of people on it, um, is that they had a 30 to 40 percent reduction in HIV new diagnoses. I suspect it's probably higher than that now. So, for example, in Dean Street in London, they have 25,000 men on PrEP. Um, and I, I did get a query through one of the GP forums, I think, to say that they thought that accessing PrEP in the county was difficult. Um, I don't know where that came from. It's actually probably not very difficult to get it here. You just literally need to phone the clinic and we will see you. There's no restriction on numbers for PrEP. 
um, there's some commissioning jiggery pokery behind the scenes, but we would certainly not turn somebody away for prep if they needed it. Um, so I hope that answers. If you have any queries at all, um, I will put in the chat after this my email and Anna's email and you know, you're more than welcome to just email us and ask about it. Um, and the other thing just before I finish on that is that I have tried very hard, for example, some of our um, African women who probably are at relatively high risk don't usually perceive themselves for high risk. So I had a lady not that long ago who had come in for post exposure prophylaxis. But actually, when I suggested that um, when I suggested that she had prep, she was like, well, why would I need that? Oh, sorry. Poor, poor Anna's using my computer and sorry, <laughs> I logged I logged out of it. <laughs> cool. Um, so, yes, I think there's a there's a piece of work being done in quite a number of research studies looking at how we can make people aware that they would be eligible for prep, which is why that website's quite useful. OK, um, is there anything else before I just whiz on? There's a couple more. I think they'll yeah. keep coming They'll keep through, trickling Sophie. in. Yeah, um, one of them, uh, I think she's saying, are you happy to see difficult coil fits? Oh, that's, that's a very good that. question. Yes, that's fine. Yeah, okay. just referring. Um, I think there was one more. Are condoms free for all ages at sexual health clinics? They that's are. Question. <laughs> we don't give out bucket loads at a time, but we do. Mm -hmm. They are free. Yes. <laughs> so Perfect. Thank you. OK, so the C card just on the back is is there. The condoms are free at a place that does C card provision. So if the young person or older person, whereas young people actually is under 25, if they've got a C card, they can go to a pharmacy that does C card and get free condoms. That's the purpose of that. OK, I'll plod on for now and then we can gather up some more at the end. Um, so I just wanted to mention about opt out testing. Those of you who work in the north of like what is now the north um, unitary authority, um, Kettering Hospital, I work quite closely with and we've um, implemented opt out testing for HIV when people have um, a blood test for another reason and are admitted. So this has been quite a big piece of work to try and get everybody to buy into it um, and also to fund it and it works to a degree um, but we have been quite successful in picking up um, new diagnoses in patients who would otherwise not have tested. Nationally there is a push for people in high prevalence areas so that's where there's more than two in a thousand um, HIV positive patients in an area um, for us to test whenever they have blood. So that could be in general practice, it could be um, when they go to hospital um, and actually Northamptonshire as a whole is in a higher prevalence area and Northampton itself um, has a prevalence rate of over three in a thousand, uh, Wellingborough about two, 2.4, 2.5 in a thousand and Kettering just around two. So the patients who present to the main hospitals are certainly at risk enough that we would want to do opt out testing. Um, last year, there was a load of money put into opt out testing in A&E's. Um, we haven't found locally that that's been very easy to implement, partly because people come in and out of A&E. Well, I was going to say quickly, but probably not at the moment. But, you know, they're not all coming in and having blood the the follow-up for that is quite tricky so at KGH we elected just to do admission so that would be medical surgical gynae um, anyone who's actually just admitted into a bed um, and the plan is to try and roll out something similar in NGH um, but we are really struggling in terms of um, technicalities and the the will is there and the buy-in is there but the funding is proving a challenge so watch this space for that um, I'm I'm going to make it my life's mission, I think. 
Okay, so this is just some kind requests really from you. Um, we've had a few patients who've died recently um, and we haven't known about it. So they've, they've died in hospital or they've died at home and we've phoned to try and book an appointment for them because we haven't heard from them and then their partners had to tell us that they died. Um, so um, if you do have any patients on your register that do die, could you just let us know um, if, if they're under our care? If, if you don't know whether they're under our care or not, just let us know and then we can probably track them through our sort of national system. Um, in terms of medication, we talked about this before um, with the drug interactions pathway. I think if you can let us know of any changes in medication, that would be ideal. However, I appreciate you're all snowed under. So the simplest way for you is just to say to the patient, you are now on a new medication, you need to let the HIV clinic know. Because most medications are fine, but there are some absolute howlers. For example, um, we don't use so much simvastatin now, but simvastatin and one of our drugs causes rhabdomyolysis and when people have, have had quite severe side effects from it. So um, the drug interaction issue is, is quite a challenge. Um, and then I've just put here about considering HIV testing in new patient registrants if you are taking blood for other reasons. And we've had, um, you know, a credit back to you as a, as a group. Um, we've had a few new diagnoses in general practice recently, just with people coming from a high risk country and being offered a test as a screen, um, which has been um, good for the patient. And, you know, it's good for us that they engage in care earlier rather than later. Um, Again, I could do a whole talk on HIV, but um, the Midlands um, is one of the areas in the country where we're not very good at picking people up early. So we have a, a, a kind of 40 to 50 percent late diagnosis rate even now, which is is not brilliant. Um, and what we mean by that is that a late diagnosis is where that person's CD4 counts, so their immunity has dropped to a level where they are at risk of other infections. Um, and the idea of, of testing people earlier is that we can prevent that. OK. So um, I'm just looking at the time, so we're right for time. So just thought I'd just mention um, some of these came up in the in the uh, chat box. So what's new? So PrEP we've talked about um, today a little bit more than um, yeah, which is good. You know, it's good. And ask, please ask any questions. So, yeah, PrEP is available. And I've, I didn't really mention, but PrEP is a is a medication as a single tablet that has two medications in it. Um, as I said, you can take it daily or you you can do it event based. So you take two tablets before you might have sex and then a tablet afterwards and then one the next day if you do end up having sex. So what we found over the last four years with we originally had a trial and then it's been rolled out into practice. Um, is that it's really dependent on that person's kind of lifestyle. So I tend to say to the younger people, you know, if your life is a bit more unpredictable or spontaneous, then taking it daily is probably better. If you are more of a planner and you know um, what, what you're up to and you, you know, some of our patients might only go and have sex at the weekend, then they know they can just take it um, around the weekend and when their potential risk times would be. Um, it is important that people take PrEP properly. Um, we have had um, some serial conversions in people who hadn't turned up for a follow up or they'd taken their PrEP wrongly. So it's important that they come to us and we are able to explain to them and they understand how to take it and, and as importantly, how to stop it because there's a tail with the drug. So um, if, if I had sex yesterday, I would still need to take two tablets um, today and tomorrow in order to prevent my risk. Um, Mpox vaccinations I've kind of talked about. Um, so the the news on that really is that the government are winding up that programme by the end of June, July, end of July. Um, so some clinics in London have had um, double vaccinations because it's a two vaccine course. We actually haven't had the vaccine long enough to get anybody to have a second vaccine. Um, and in fact, we can't fill our clinics for people for a first vaccine. So there are um, reports coming through now through the sexual health network um, that are showing that monkeypox is on the rise again. And obviously we're entering into um, the season for pride um, in most big cities. So we're expecting another spike, um, but just to be aware of. Um, and, and anecdotally, it was quite interesting because we diagnosed more chickenpox than I've ever seen in sexual health <laughs> when the monkeypox um, outbreak occurred um, because people were sending in 
pox like um you know pox like skin rashes and we saw a lot of uh, yeah a lot of varicella okay so hpv vaccination um for men who have sex with men um this is now changed from um two well, it used to be three vaccines not one and six and then it was at six months then it was not in six months and now it's gone to just one vaccine so that will free up quite a lot of space in our clinic but if you've got a patient who's had one they probably won't need a second one now because it's the the same vaccine um and as you know for the younger people um it's now Gardasil 9 so it's got the nine valent um version of the HPV vaccine um I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about research. So we're quite an active research department. Um, we have been doing some studies in the last few years. Um, one is a kind of qualitative study asking HIV positive people about their experiences, um, which feeds into a national database. Um, and then they let us know what it is that, that people living in 2023 with HIV um what their needs are, what they feel about their services, what they think they might need for the future. Um, so that's quite helpful for us. Um, also, we've been running a treatment for a new antibiotic for gonorrhea. Um, we are really struggling to recruit for that. Um, it is a brand new antibiotic that's been used um, in urine infections and it's quite promising, but the the patients have to be um, recruited within seven days of their positive test. So there's been a bit of a lag. And then when when we have approached suitable people, they can't attend for the follow up. So it's been a, a bit of a disappointment from my perspective because I've tried so hard. But um, yeah, that is still recruiting until the end of June. Um, we so just to put that in context, the 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 normal treatment would be an injection. So some people are quite keen on on this trial because it's tablets. Um, the other bit of research that we did, um, which closed last year, was about a new treatment for bacterial vaginosis, and I'm waiting for the outcome of that, but that was was well recruited too. And then we're currently piloting a new way to give more um, immediate test results in clinic um, and watch this space for, for the results of that. So th this is a, a system that is used quite widely in London in one of the clinics there where the patient will do their sample in clinic and then we will put it straight onto the machine and it runs the test in 90 minutes and then we can phone them back and say, yes, you've got chlamydia or no, you haven't. So we are targeting um, patients who are maybe contacts of chlamydia because if their test is negative, they don't need to have antibiotics and they don't need to be treated as a contact because we know they're already negative. Um, so that's quite exciting. Um, another kind of request really is um, that as the public health department, they are often asking us about access to at-risk groups. Um, obviously our outreach team do a brilliant job of liaising with, with everybody that they are contacted by or can get to see but if you have in your practices or um, even through your own personal connections any um, access to voluntary groups of patients who might potentially be at risk of STIs or um, not accessing contraception and things in the same way then please let us know because we're more than happy to um, do some outreach to those groups but finding the right people is the biggest challenge. I also wanted to highlight about the RSE provision. So you'll all be aware, particularly if you've got children at secondary school that um, and primary school, that the, the RSE provision changed. Um, it was supposed to be a couple of years ago and it's now in force. Um, that has had a knock on effect for the outreach team in that we've had a lot of requests to come in and do RSE education in schools um, for the younger ages and we um, are aware this is a challenge and I know the 0 to 19 service are also um, managing this but it was just to highlight that there's a bit of a there is a bit of a challenge there um, in terms of delivering good quality RSE. Um, I wanted just to mention about injectable HIV medication so um, this is the new kid on the block for us. Um, it's an injection of two antiretroviral tab, um, two antiretroviral medic medicines. One is one we've used for a long time, real pivrin, and the other one is a new, completely new drug called cabotegravir. And um, we have a few patients, so we're into double figures now who are using it in the Kettering site, um, and we haven't got anyone yet on it in Northampton um but our patients really love it um 
it is given every eight weeks, a bit like depot, um, and they, there is a window either side. So you need to come within six days either side of your date. Um, there are some injection site reactions and there's a slightly higher risk of failure on it over three years looking at the studies. But um, it's only licensed in the UK for patients who are already undetectable. So although it seems amazing for you know the complicated patients who don't attend or have a kind of chaotic lifestyle, we're not actually able to use it in them at the moment, which is a shame. Um, they do have a license for that in the States, but not here. Um, and then just to mention about the new FSRH guidelines, so um, the 52 microgram um, 11 adjustral IUS is now licensed for six years, um, which you probably all know about anyway, but we just thought we'd flag that up. OK, so this is how to contact us. Um, so the numbers all changed relatively recently. So the NGH number is the one on the top there. Ashwood Centre just next down and the outreach service have their own telephone line and increasingly we are relying on email so these are the two generic email addresses on NHS net for both of the clinics um, Anna and I work well I'm mainly at Kettering and I cross over to Northampton on a Wednesday Anna works cross county and Lynn is mainly based in um, Northampton and we're getting a new consultant who's coming to us in August so if you've got any queries um, you know like if, if it's about a a Wellingborough patient and you don't know which unit they go to because they could come to either Northampton or to Kettering, particularly for the HIV, then then you can just email either and um, the message will get to us. OK, so I just wanted to take a few moments and can see it's quarter two, so we've got about 15 minutes. Um, perhaps we can go through a few of the questions and then what I'd really like is to try and get a little bit of feedback. Um, we're in the middle. Actually, I don't know if the next slide shows it. Yes, let me just talk about this really briefly. Um, so the local authority, some of you may be involved in this, are currently undertaking a sexual health needs assessment for the county. And it, that group of people has got a representative from general practice. It's got representatives from um, 0 to 19 and other any service really that provides any kind of sexual health input um, and they are trying to assess what you know demographics like you know how big is our county cohort who is likely to need care moving forward what's the HIV cohort who gets gonorrhea who gets chlamydia that kind of thing so if you've got any comments on what you're seeing in general practice um, I'd be really grateful if you could share them in the chat or if you want to get in touch with me afterwards, because um, to be honest, we don't have a finger on what on a pulse of what's happening in general practice. And there is a representative there for you. But I'm sure that just like I can't represent everyone's sexual health thoughts in the county, that person can't necessarily represent everything from all the GPs. So um, if there's anything you'd like to feed in, um, I've taken the notes about the implant fitting. That's really helpful. It sounds like most of you are OK for implants, but there's a coil waiting list. Um, then, yes, let me know and I'll take that to those meetings. So, yeah, in terms of feedback, we'd just be interested in what you like about the service, what challenges you have. And if you've got any training requirements, we're more than happy to come and train. Um, we each have our own kind of favourite things, but we would tailor it to whatever you needed. And before COVID, I did quite a lot of talks to GP practices. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to unshare my screen if I can. Um, let me see. Stop sharing. Ah, here's some questions. Let me go. Going to find the chat. Uh, do you want me to just call them out for you? Yeah, why not? Okay, first one. And just then I can try and look masterful. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> just to confirm, for south of the county, we still email Ashwood Centre if we need a deep implant removing. Yes, that is a that is a sort of geographical complication because Ros Phillips, who's our deep implant person, works out of Ashwood. So yes. They coordinate it, but sometimes she will come and remove it actually in Northampton, if that makes sense. She has a special scanner and she takes it with her. 
Right. Um, next question. With regards to HIV blood testing, can this be added to normal bloods and does patient need any counselling prior to blood test? That's a very good question. Um, no, the short answer is we dispensed with counselling a long time ago, mainly because um, these days most people live well nearly everybody living with hiv can get insurance um so that's not an issue the treatment's amazing so we would the life expectancy is the same on treatment as it would be um for somebody not living with hiv so i would normally say you know we're doing some screening because we're checking you know you you dip people's urine for diabetes and do a blood glucose and we don't sit and spend hours going, oh, you know, diabetes is a lifelong chronic condition and your feet might drop off and your eyes might go and you, you might have renal failure. So, yeah, we're just trying to normalise testing for HIV. Um, and yes, in terms of the actual bottle, they can't add it on because it normally has to go to serology. So you'd have to take a separate bottle. Um, as far as I'm aware, if your bloods go to because it looks like you're in crick. And you say, um, I think your bloods will go to Northampton, in which case it's a yellow top. And actually, it's the same at um, um, it's the same at Ashwood. Okay, uh, right. who are the commissioners for the service? For OK, so this is quite complicated. So the commissioners for the sexual health and the contraception service are the public health departments from N NCC as was. So that part of the contract comes from them and was a tendered contract about four years ago. The HIV service was commissioned as part of that, but actually the funding comes from NHS England. So that's based on the number of patients we have in the county and we have the, the antiretroviral therapy is funded directly from that pot. I hope that answers your question. And then just to clarify about 52 milligram LNG IUS, is that six years from new insertion from now or does it apply to existing in situ coils? I'm pretty sure it applies from now because we the, the only real change has been that we knew that in Europe they use the six year. Actually, some countries have seven year licensing for Mirena anyway, um, but the faculty have just updated that. So, yeah, we're just not that stressed. You know, if, if someone's due booked in to have a, a coil changed and the appointment's already made, then I wouldn't call them and say, come back in a year. I would just switch it. But if we've got people who are asking, then you can wait the six years. Uh, question from Laura regarding a contraception update. Laura, just to let you know, we are in discussion with a provider at the moment and are hoping to have dates confirmed fairly soon for that. Um, it'll again, it'll go up on the Training Hub website as soon as soon as that book date is booked. Uh, and then the last one, uh, is there a way of getting condoms at the surgery so we can pass them along to patients who we feel are at risk? They may not feel comfortable going elsewhere to get them. That is a really good point. And the short answer is. We used to do that. Hang on, let me work out where you are and I will find out if you could just let Craig, uh, no, because you're, you're, Maria, you're logged on as guest. So if you could just let Craig know or me where you are and um, I'll try and sort that out because we did used to do it. It may be that you have to um, become a C-card provider, but I, I need to just check with Outreach about that. Oh, Anna's back. This is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me just ask Anna the question about the coil yeah. from now. So if someone's got a Levin and gestural in, um 52 microgram they they don't have to change it till six years even if it's already in yeah yeah, yeah. Fine. i was right a <laughs> few uh, oh there we go R rushton medical center rushton okay now that's fine i'll let you know i just need to check with um with outreach because they're better at that than me um we used to give them to some gp practices but the but often they didn't use them and then they all went out of date so i just need to double check if there's a mechanism for that um do we not update online? Are there any coil coil fitter updates? I haven't actually, I'm Anna's back now, but I haven't heard about a coil fitter update for a while. Bayer used to do them. I could find out um, and I'll speak to Roz as well. So yeah, I think because of COVID, it all just went by the wayside. But I'll find out, Jane, because Bayer used to 
So obviously Bayer make quite a lot of coils and they used to do a coil fitter regional update um, probably once a year, I think. We could contact the rep and find out for you. OK, um, Alison said we've got C card in our practice, but only for under 25s. Yeah, that's how it works. So, yes, in terms of condoms for older people, then no, that would be more tricky. I think I could probably swing it for the under 25s, but not for the older. Uh, so, OK, I'm writing down a list of so rushed <laughs> green view. I like this. Um, uh, Michelle is only pharmacies who provide EHC. Oh no, we we provide it. Yes, one hundred percent. So yeah, um, we provide all forms of emergency contraception, including um, emergency coils. So um, yes, just send the patients down. Um, just looking at the chat. Woodview, right? I've got I've got the. Um, it might be as easy. I've got those three GPs, but if there's anybody else. How do you start using the C-card system in practice? Um, well, you get trained by our outreach team who then tell you. So um, I think what I would do is maybe get the outreach team to put something together. Um, if you're interested, um, I'm conscious, Amy, you're at Bugbrook, aren't you? I mean, you've got quite a lot of young people and they don't have really very easy transport to get to us we've we've had a few young people from Bugbrook who've got in a pickle so um yeah would you be okay with me getting it'll be a good idea um getting Lisa to contact you um and then she can talk you through it okay right it's five two any last queries Anna's here <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Ladies, I was just wondering, would it be helpful for the if you do manage to have a contact for Bayer for the co the coil updates and you manage to speak to the, the outreach team for the C card training, if you come through the training hub, because that way Craig can um it means you're not having to collect collate a load of email addresses and it become very complicated or somebody be missed out. And then what Craig can do is is advertise that training and we can set that up and then send it to everyone in our um weekly comms. Is that yeah. OK? So if I I think, Anna, you've got my email, haven't you? Yeah, um, I do. I'll find out a bit more yeah. information and then. Perfect. That's amazing. Also, um, Sophie from Saxon Spires has just asked about the slides, so um, we can send the slides to you, yeah. Melanie, and then and Craig, yeah, and you can perfect. send them around to everybody if that's OK. Absolutely. Perfect. What what I tend to do is immediately after the PLT sessions of any content that we have to share, will be on the website and I'll send a link out to that. Great. And then what I'll do in the meantime is I'll find out about the condoms and the C card and then perhaps we can put the information in the end of the presentation so that yes, when you look on yes. it, you'll see. Perfect. I will also ask Lisa to get in touch, but that's probably easiest. Great. Thank you very much for engaging with us. We didn't get to the cases, but basically it was just recurrent herpes and or the other one? The gonorrhea. gonorrhea. Yeah. And the, the take home point was recurrent herpes. We're quite happy to prescribe um, suppression um, depending on how many outbreaks they've had. And the gonorrhea was just a flag to say that we've got um, there's a lot of resistance to antibiotics. So just make sure you send them to us so we can do. Yeah, do cultures. OK, thank you very much for having us. Thank you, thank ladies. You. Thank Peace you. Take care. Bye. 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 Ah, oh, she's on already. Eager beaver. <laughs> Is um Nicola? Oh yes, she's here. Susie's here. Wonderful. Oh look at that, just like magic. I didn't even have to say your name, Susie. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so the next session, everyone. It's it's quite quick today. It's sort of on to the next. Um, we have um. Nicola Fitzpatrick and Susie Andrews that are going to talk to us about the lower li 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 the lower limb wound pathway. Um, they'll go more into detail about that. Um, we'll probably do the same as we did before, Nicola, where we use the chat box, but we'll kind of, if, if you need us to help, just give us a shout. And over to you guys. Thank you very much. Just give me one moment to make sure I've got the slides in the right spot. And um, if someone can give me a thumbs up if you can hear me OK. 
can hear you perfectly. Excellent. This is all going too well. What could go wrong? Hey, OK.